Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Young. I'm a member of the Committee 100, and I happen to chair the Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings Initiative. Uh, this is the 26th event that we have had uh, that have been a mix of virtual, in-person, et cetera, since February of 2020. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, the three team leaders of the, uh, the next gen project of Committee 100 that produced a video that you're going to see. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to uh, say a little housekeeping, and that is you know, we have a large group who registered for this. Uh, given how it's set up, uh, after we chat, I chat with the, uh, the team leaders and we see the video, we'll open it up to Q&A from all of you. And there are two ways that you can uh, uh, ask your question. Uh, you can just type it in the Q&A chat box or the regular chat box. Uh, all four of us are going to be able to see your 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 questions, and we'll select ones, and I'll let the uh, the panelists answer the ones they uh, want to answer. The only other thing I want to mention is the uh, next, uh, the 26th uh, Committee of 100 Asian American Career Ceilings webcast is going to be on July 6th. And it's going to be on Asian American career ceilings, corporate journeys, and ethnic differences. Uh, I'm actually very excited about it. The concept was we've got executives, senior executives from three different companies, but from three different Asian American ethnicities. Uh, one is Raj Ratnakar, who is the head of all the strategy for DuPont. He's an Indian American. The second is Jenny Ming, who is the uh, is, uh, is was a former CEO of uh, Charlotte Russi and also the founder uh, and former president of Old Navy, uh, my favorite place to shop to dress my son when he was young. Uh, and she is also a Committee 100 member. And the last is we have Ken Tanji, who is an executive vice president, and he's the chief financial officer of Prudential Financial. So we'll have an Indian American, we have a Chinese American, and we have uh, you know, a Japanese American executive. And they're going to talk about their careers and the issues about career ceilings, but then they're going to have a discussion about whether they really feel their differences, depending upon whether you're, you know, Indian American or Japanese American or Chinese American. I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation. And that is going to be uh, at uh, four o'clock Eastern time on July 6th. And uh, we hope to see many of you for that event. So with that, let's uh, turn to the current program. So you see the, the three uh, people on the screen. We've got Dustin Ling, Alan Chen, Marianne Zhao, uh, and they are the three uh, project leaders of the Next Gen uh, project under the Committee 100's Next Generation Leaders Program uh, that also have uh, Doug, Douglas Yoon, Ben Wei, uh, Leah Wang and John Lian as members of that team. Uh, and uh, the, I'll just briefly say the Next Gen program has been in existence at Committee 100 for many years. And the whole idea is to select up and coming uh, 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 leaders, uh, Chinese American leaders from different uh, professions and uh, activities and really give them the opportunity to meet with each other, to work together on projects, and also to get to and uh, know some of the Committee 100 members. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, perhaps in alphabetical order by last name. So Alan, you'll be first uh, and have each of you just take a, a minute and describe what you do. Uh, and then I'll turn to the issue of how this whole project got started. So Alan, you want to start? Absolutely. Really nice to be with you all today. My name is Alan Chen. I am a managing director and partner at the Boston Consulting Group, and I am part of C100's Next Gen Leaders from last year. Uh, and that's where I met some of my peers here, Dustin and Marion, and that's how we got connected um, on this project. Really, really excited to be here with you, answer your questions, share a bit about this passion project with you. And, um, at, you know, outside of uh, C100, I'm also uh, an active member of BCG's Asian Diversity Network, which is our employee resource group. And um, yeah, just great to be here. I'll pass it along to Dustin. Great. Hi, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. And, and Peter, I'll say you look very sharp this evening. I know you're going to an event, but it's nice to see you in your, uh, in your talks. 
But um, thank you for inviting us. Uh, my name is Dustin Ling. I've been with Citibank for uh, almost 20 years. Um, specifically, I'm in our corporate banking business, specifically focused on sovereign clients, so public sector clients, in particular supranationals. Um, in addition to being part of the NGL or Next Generation Leaders Program at Committee of 100, I'm also very involved at Cities um, Asian Leaders uh, Program at the ERG here, uh, uh, but also I sit on the um, Advisory Council for Ascend New York, which is really talking through the life cycle of Asian Americans in the workforce. So super passionate about this topic and very elated to be here with Alan and Miriam. Marianne? Hey everyone, my name is Marianne Zhou. I'm a journalist covering US-China uh, relations, business, economy, and as a uh, passion project, I also write about Asian American issues and I'm very excited to be here. And since Dustin mentioned the fact that I have a tuxedo on, I just want to explain, I do not normally wear a tuxedo for these uh, webcasts, uh, but I, in fact, I'm going to the uh, Japan Society Annual Gala, which my wife is the, the chairperson, so I'm required to go, but I have to leave immediately after this uh, so that I won't be late. So uh, don't expect me to wear this uh, garb every time. Uh, uh, but anyway, thank you for the note, uh, Dustin. So uh, in no particular order, any, in fact, any of you can answer this question, which is tell us about the next gen project, uh, you know, exercise uh, that the Committee 100 has and how your particular group got formed. Me, go ahead, Alan. Well, I can maybe take a stab at it. So when we all met at the C100 conference last year, one of the things that we did very at the very end was we split up our NGL group into three teams and we used a session um, in the afternoon to really think through some areas that we were passionate about, what type of projects we might have to, to do. And our commitment to the Next Gen Leaders program was that for the following year, we would work together with this team, continue to refine our idea, figure out teaming roles, who was going to be a team, team lead, who is going to be doing this task, who is going to be doing that task. And that in the November that followed, we would have a pitch off where we would present to some key members of the C100 and really kind of show off what we were planning to do in the coming months. Uh, and so we did that and we chose a particular project around Asian career ceilings that you'll see the output of. Um, but this has really been a passion project for all of us, the three of us, but also a bigger team behind us. Um, and that's kind of the inception of our project. Dustin or Marion, have anything that you want to add to kind of how this came to be? Yeah, yeah I, had, I had the privilege of being the mentor. And you actually, the project, Dustin, the project really evolved, right? It didn't start out, you, you changed it over time. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure, sure. I think one of the things that we um, immediately gravitated to and we talk about, especially, um, you know, if you're in the workforce is representation, right? Um, so what we noticed is uh, within our cohort of individuals, we had people that were in banking like myself. We had people like Miriam who are in journalism or media. We have people that were in tech or consulting like Alan, but also people that were in government like Doug. And everybody was talking about a very similar theme. And that theme is Asians being at the table and being represented and having our voices. And that translated to initially what we had thought of was having our service project being evolved around the bamboo ceiling, which then kind of permeated into how do we start off with a baseline of telling that story in an articulate way within the Asian American community, but then also to people outside the Asian community so that there's allyship around the ceiling. And what is the ceiling, defining it? Because I think there isn't a lot of detail around what is the ceiling, where does it happen, where does, it, where does the ceiling start and end? So we wanted to really work towards producing something that was digestible and consumable. Because I think one of the things that we recognized was there's a lot of white papers out there. There's a lot of white papers that are 100 pages long, that are PDFs that were created by PhD 
um, you know, very, very talented individuals who write a lot of these PDF white papers, but it's not always super consumable, right? And so part of our, our concept to Peter's point that has evolved was creating a short form video or an explainer video like Vox in order to give you the explanation of what the Asian glass ceiling or the bamboo ceiling is in four minutes. And go ahead, Peter. Yeah, and so Miriam, of course, we know that you had a uh, $10 million Hollywood budget, right, to do this uh, video, so you could hire all sorts of people, whatever. So tell us about the experience, because obviously you had some funds, but it was only so much. And, you know, it's interesting, you, you know, in my opinion, and I'll let the audience decide, I think you did a great job without a huge budget. But uh, tell us a little bit about the process and how you chose to sort of put it together under the constraints you had. So I think after we decided that this is what we want to do, and uh, the challenge was to find a partner. And luckily, coming from journalism school, you know, I did have a lot of friends who work in uh, media and documentary. So I'm very thankful uh, for my friend Stephanie, who works at EST Media, and they um, became a partner for, for this project. And they did a very really amazing job with the animation. And they also charge a very uh, friend rate. Yeah, <laughs> that's wonderful. Any other comments you want to make before we see the video? I mean, and, and, and I guess, uh, you know, I know that you have tried to make it available, and this is just one way that we're trying to uh, disseminate uh, that this video. So for those people who want to binge watch and watch it over and over again, uh, where, where can they find it? Or if they want a friend to be able to, to, to watch it, uh, where can they find it? So I would, what, one thing I would say is if you take any action from this, the whole idea, like with the Committee of 100, is to create a public good. So this is not just for us. This is for the community. Um, and, and so it is available on YouTube. It is also available on Instagram. Within the first week, it got 1,500 views. So use it. Use it within your organization. Use it to tell the story to your AAPI network, but also the non-AAPI network. Because in order to make progress, you need your DEI officers or, or diversity officers to buy into the story and they don't have time to read a 100 page document. So show them the video, use it as a public good. The only other thing I would say is that we are empowered to tell our own stories and you do that with facts, right? There's a reason this project is called the 20 million project. That 20 million is us. You know, that 20 million represents the 6% of individuals that are AAPI that live in America. And that is, does not discriminate. That is a full population of one third East Asian, one third South Asian, and one third Southeast Asian. So that number, as it grows, as it, as it becomes more influential, is our number. So it's, it's combining storytelling, to Miriam's point, as well as facts and data. OK, great. So with that, what I'd like to do is play it. And I will tell, just so the audience knows, um, we're, we're, you're going to see the Instagram version uh uh rather than the full youtube version and the only reason why is that zoom will not accept you know a, a resolution above a certain size in terms of video sharing so again if you want to see it over and over again just check under youtube and you'll see the full size youtube version here we go referring to something that affects nearly all 20 million asian americans from south to southeast to east asians Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in the US and are projected to pass 35 million by 2060. Yet Asian American representation at senior levels is sorely missing, not just in arts and entertainment, but across businesses, government, and various other industries. Many attribute this to the Asian glass ceiling. But what is the Asian glass ceiling and what can be done about it? The Asian glass ceiling refers to the multitude of cultural, individual, and structural barriers, both visible and invisible, that exist for Asian Americans in the workplace. So even as minority groups' rights represent more voter blocks and the workforce, Asians are still not making it to the top. Here's what's shocking. Asians make 13% of America's workforce, but only 6%, less than half, hold executive posts. While Black professionals account for 8% of the workforce, but only 5% of executive roles. 
Compare that to white professionals who represent 69% of the workforce and 85% of executive roles. According to Harvard Business Review, Asians are also the least likely group to be promoted to management positions. There's a few reasons for this. One, stereotypes. Asians are considered passive, shy, and lacking in leadership because of cultural differences. These obstacles and perceptions stop Asian American career growth and cast them in the light of a doer or a follower and not a leader. So the higher up the career ladder you go, the less Asians you'll find at the top. According to a KPMG study, 61% of Asian Americans have college degrees, but is this reflected in their career progress? No. Last year, a McKinsey report found that Asians are overrepresented by two times their share of the population at the entry level, but this representation drops off by more than half overall at the board of director level. Some of these are certainly individual, and there are anomalies, like Google CEO Sundar Pichal and CEO of Zoom Eric Nguyen. But many Asians and these ideas about Asians and non-Asians face a lot of indoctrination and implicit bias from a very young age. Then there's the model minority myth, the idea that Asians are extremely hardworking and successful and are proof that pulling yourself by the bootstraps in America works. The model minority myth is used to drive a wedge between Asians and other races. It also flattens Asians into a monolith. It also very much ignores the reality that while many Asians are top earners, Asians also have the highest income inequality within its various ethnic groups in America. For example, Hmong and Cambodians have some of the highest poverty rates in America, owing to their refugee status and how they came to America due to war and genocide. Lumping all Asians together neglects people who are in need of help. According to the National Women's Law Center, Burmese women make an average of 52 cents for every $1 a white man makes. 12% of Asian Americans actually live in poverty. Asians also get routinely discriminated against at work especially women who are often caricatured. There's a trope of the infantilized Asian woman, the sexualized woman, the one that is too aggressive, the one that is too meek, the good follower, the list goes on. Ellen Powell, former Reddit CEO, describes her career experience. You know, the woman is assumed to be you know, the assistant. You know, and it's just these little things that add up. They call it like the death by a thousand cuts. And you're just constantly trying to get that equal playing field, but being taken out of it. And then there's the fact that people think Asians look the same. One in six Asian women say they are frequently mistaken for someone else, making it easy for managers to overlook their individual contributions. According to the Boston Consulting Group, Asians are also more likely to receive critical feedback compared to all other ethnicities. In many cases, at two times the occurrence rate, they're essentially held to a harsher standard. So how do we shatter the Asian glass ceiling across the board? Buck G, an executive director at Ascend, has talked about employer diversity initiatives needing to hire more equitably across race and gender lines. Individually, right, systemically, there are things you can do to, to try to counter that. But absolutely, there's a systemic issue that needs to change. The Boston Consulting Group study also shows that while Asian people actively join corporate diversity groups within companies, 70% view them as social versus 30% who view them as focused on their career advancement. Then research released by AAPI data has highlighted that even though Asians are more likely to participate in such affinity groups, they don't feel supported within them. These AAPI groups should be empowered to become more than just social gatherings. Asians need to have an actual seat at the table and shape hiring practices and conversations. It's not enough to celebrate Black History Month or Lunar New Year. The work must scratch beyond the surface. If we want to see more Asian representation at higher levels, it's okay to ask for more, to demand more, and advocate for ourselves and each other. Okay, excellent. Very well done. So uh, why don't we do this? Let's uh, open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, and what I'd like is 
anyone in the audience, just whatever questions you might have, just type it in the chat box and we'll be able to see it. Okay. Uh, okay, we've got three who have raised their hands. So let's figure out what to do with them. <laughs> okay, hold on. Yeah, somebody had mentioned that there may not be a chat box. And it's, it's not a chat box. Okay, well, then I'm going to allow them to individually talk. For some reason, we got a problem. We'll have to talk to Eric Yuan who is actually, he was the head of Zoom, but he's actually a member of the Committee 100. I'm gonna send him a note right after this. So the first one is Michael Mao, and we're gonna let you, allow you to talk. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I was struck by how the, how the very wonderful um, four minute promo uh, was from the point of view of an Asian woman, a single speaker uh, pitching the men, uh, the Asian man as further somebody who does not speak up. Because we have seen lots of newscasters, uh, like starting with Connie Chung, Kaidi Tong. So they are talking heads that are uh, Asian women, but very few Asian men. And this simply it, 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 it adds to the myth that Asian men are are a poor English speaker and do not speak up. So Michael, is somewhere in your comment, is there a question? <laughs> yes, the question is that why have you elected to, to for us to only hear from a single woman narrator instead of uh, uh, what people do these days to equal, to level the playing field of a man and a woman speaking alternately, which would have broken the monotony Okay, well, let any, anyone on the of our panel would like to answer that? Maybe I can start and I can defer to Miriam. I, I think, Michael, that's a very good observation. I think we had about four and a half minutes of the video. So we wanted to, one of the things that we really wanted to do was elevate the, the experience of um, the Asian American community that actually has a double glass ceiling. So, you know, women in particular have not only the stereotypes that they deal with as from a gender perspective, but also from the ethnic perspective. So it was important to us that we actually, it's a very good question, Michael, because Miriam and, and Alan and I talked ad nauseum about who would be the right narrator for this. And, you know, like Michelle Yeoh's moment, which particularly was intentional as well, that we wanted to highlight and start with, we really wanted to highlight the parts of the community that is often experiencing the most uh, a series of challenges and obstacles. And to us, we felt that that was women, not to say that Asian men, whether you're East, South or Southeast, um, don't experience that, but we wanted to really kind of hone in on um, those individuals that, that experience the, uh, the, the, the stereotype, stereotypes even more so. But uh, that's kind of my experience and probably my views. Alan and Miriam? Um, I'll go next. Um, well, I think Dustin uh, answered that question very beautifully. Um, so I would just add that, again, it's a social media video that we, um, you know, try to make it very concise. So two, more than one speaker would be too much. So it would be very confusing. Um, and also, you know, having an Asian woman uh, speak, I don't think it necessarily means that the Asian men don't speak, right? Um, so I think it's representative well enough that, you know, we can all work together and move forward together. Alan, any comment before we go on to the next question? No, I think my fellow panelists answered it very well. Okay. Next question is from Jenny Wen, and I'm going to allow her to talk. Go ahead, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the video. Um, I thought I'm really excited to share it with everybody. So I my question is, in your experience in promoting um, Asian Americans, um, how have you been able to both work towards um, work towards also 
diversity for underrepresented minorities without losing the focus of your our primary goal, which is you know breaking the glass ceiling for Asian Americans. Um, in my experience, I think sometimes there there's been a range of uh, of some Asian American leaders who feel like the competition is with other minorities, and it's been sometimes harder to have a consensus of how can we battle um, white supremacy and the overall lack of representation. So I'm very curious about your your um, approach. I, Alan, do you want to go? Yeah, maybe I'll take a first stab at it. it it's such a good question. And it was a, a, a thought that was constantly on our mind as we were walking a very, very fine line of how we wanted to convey what I consider to be an incredibly nuanced picture, right? And I think we tried very, very hard to make our message feel not exclusionary and not like we were the only ones who were having a problem. And so you might recall in our video, we talked about the disparity between the base workforce of Asians and then the percentage that are there for in executive positions for both Asians and Blacks, right? Because the disparity exists for both. And then even within Asians, we wanted to de-average the outcomes and make sure that the nuance wasn't lost within the different types of Asians, because even within that, the outcomes are subtly different. And so I don't know that like our video alone will somehow solve this problem for everyone, but it was very acutely on our minds and we tried our best to provide a both informative and concise story, but also cast a broader net to help people realize that there is nuance and value in de-averaging, right? We can't just lump everybody together, but there are many pockets of people who experience this challenge in their own unique ways. Yeah, and may maybe, I, maybe I can add, um, it's funny because during Asian Heritage Month, I got the same question, which I think Jenny, you're gonna get, to, you got to at the Asian Society. And I think when you're dealing within a corporation and you have diversity um, you know, leaders, it's always, it feels like a competition, right? And the whole modern minority myth is, is kind of set up to, to, you're almost set up to be competing with other dimensions of diversity. And here's my response and it's quite simple, right? All dimensions of diversity, whether you are LGBT, women, Hispanic, um, you know, uh, disabled, um, you know, all dimensions of diversity deserve every resource, nickel and dime, that they require for development. Because for many centuries, they have been probably disadvantaged to just get into the workforce on a level playing field. So the, the, the matter is not about competing, the Asians competing with other um, dimensions of diversity. All of the other dimensions of diversity should get the budgeting, the resources as they require, and so do Asians equally. The other, and the other thing I would just add is, this particular population, which tends to be 13% of the workforce, needs to also be invested in equally, right? In order for them to get towards the, the C-suite. You know, I, I wanna make a comment, which we've had a lot of different programs and I wanna make two comments. One is, it's dangerous to lump all Asian Americans together because there's some really big differences. And in fact, the researchers we've had who from Columbia, MIT and so forth have presented research that says there's some big differences like Indian Americans do better than than, than Chinese Americans or Japanese Americans. You know, the other is it's not about competing with each other. A lot of a lot of success is going to be working together. And, and there's not enough of that. And if you look across some of the different groups, they've been very successful by working together. And uh, we need more of that. It's not just each one competing for resources. They all really work together a lot more to try to get some things done. Marion, do you have any other any comments about Jenny's question before we move on to Chris Tang? Yeah, I was going to say that is a very important question to ask. And I think within our community, it's very important that, you know, we all understand we're not trying to fill a quota. We're trying to expand, right? We're trying to all move forward together. Um, and also, I think it's quite important that we help each other move up. So I think my, my first job, my first boss after graduation was actually Chinese American. Um, and I really appreciate him for hiring me and uh, opened that door for me. So I think, you know, I think um, it's a very important aspect that we all try to help each other to, to get to that table. 
Okay, our next question is from Chris Tang. Chris, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, please go um, ahead with your question. Great job on the video. Um, I think you guys did a really, um, you really encapsulated all the issues. And I think that having a single narrator um, helps focus more on the issues than who's actually, or if there were different people relaying that. Uh, my question is, what kind of feedback have you been receiving from non-AAPI community um, on the video or other discussions? Uh, um, Chris, that's a great question. Um, we always designed this not only for our community, as I mentioned, but also for non-Asians. So it's funny, at my firm, the chief diversity officer who happens to be an African-American woman said, let's play the video. Let's, so for her it, and her team who works across dimensions of diversity, it was an asset to be able to understand the nuances of that story. And so she said, let's, let's actually play it. And we played it for 400 people at City. And that is a combination of Asian and non-Asian. So at least within the diversity, uh, the DEI community, they've really embraced it at City, and that's the goal, right? For it not just to be an echo chamber of, of us talking to ourselves, but for non-Asians that are allies to us to be able to understand the nuances that they could never probably understand in the same way, it, like stepping into our shoes. Yeah, and I think the four minutes is very um, indicative of the attention span that people have these days and the information overload. So it's kind of like let me give you the, you know, the key takeaways. And then if they want to see, un understand more, they can ask or, you know, look into it. Although there are people for whom it's four minutes is beyond their attention span, right? Uh, I guarantee you, Dustin, the people at the trading, the trading arm of Citibank, their attention span is about 10 seconds. Is that right? But I think with the passage of time, you're going to get more, because you just came out with this. So I think with the passage of time, you're going to get more feedback from people and it'll be interesting what you might be able to uh as a follow-up as well we can talk about that so the next one is deborah uh is deborah sen i think i'm pronouncing it right correctly deborah go ahead hi um my name's deborah sen but first thank you very much i think this is exactly what i was looking for um to communicate uh with uh the board you know the leadership at my alma mater university of pittsburgh and um i'm a, a first generation immigrant as you can tell from my english and um and then as uh i came to this country 30 something years ago um and now starting last year i started to serve um and the board of trustee at University of Pittsburgh, my alma mater. And one of the goal is uh, uh, like to advocate for leadership, you know, to increase uh, uh, leadership, Asian American leadership. Um, and, you know, this is, so your video will really come in handy. And I would like to receive even more guidance, you know, how to, how to ask. You know, I think giving more kind of detail uh, program or whatever to communicate with provosts and you know, all the other would be helpful. So anything else, I would I'd love to receive more uh, material from you guys. Thank you. Well, and then the question is, yeah, do you have any other things? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think this is their sole product, right? So <laughs> they don't have any more, <laughs> but... Uh... You know, I would be surprised if Dustin, Allen, and Miriam stop and don't, you know, continue on and so forth. I'm certainly going to recruit them into the main Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings Initiative, get them to help. So stay tuned. I'm sure you're going to see things coming out from one or more of the three of them in the future. So that the next uh, will be uh, Ray Pun. Ray, go ahead. And by the way, we passed the 30 minute mark, but we have about mm, we have two other questions. So let's run a little bit longer and then uh, uh, and, and then uh, maybe go another five, 10 minutes. So, Ray, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for your 
thoughtful video. It was truly um, concise, impactful. And my question is, what's next? What are you planning to do um, with the million, 20 million project? Thank you. I mean, I'll take a first stab at that and then I'd love my panelists to chime in too. Uh, I think right now we're still actively in the sharing mode of this video. You know, the video has only been out for a little bit and we'll make sure that everyone who's uh, joined this uh, webinar will get the link to the full YouTube version so that you can watch it again, you can share it with your friends, you can reference it in whatever kind of meetings or contexts or groups that you might be a part of that you think uh, might get some value out of this. I think, at least from our individual standpoints, we all are pursuing multiple avenues to continue to advocate for these issues and using this video as kind of a wedge to drive that discussion and get our foot in the door to open up that discourse. I think, um, in particular, for me, I will continue to engage within my company through the ERG um, and see if we can continue to drive better advocacy for outcomes through the Asian Diversity Network, at least at the corporate level for BCG, but for other large corporates as well. I think as you saw from the video, many people who participate in ERGs find them more as social constructs and not very effective at advocating for better representation or career outcomes. And I think that this is a thing that all of us are quite passionate to change and we're continuing to kind of carry that torch forward, but I'll, I'll pass it on to my, my panelists as well. But I, I'll also mention, I asked uh, in preparing for today's webcast, I was, you know, we had a preparatory session and I did ask all three of them as well as the other, going to ask the other members of the team uh, to, to be involved with the Committee of 100 Asian American Career Ceilings Program. It's pretty extensive. We've done so many things. We've got an in-person uh, event in the fall, We've set up a social media site that allows people to share ideas and events, et cetera. So I'm gonna to try to see whether I can direct some of their energy towards what the Committee 100 is doing, in addition to the other things uh, they're doing. I also really would like anyone in the audience who would like to be involved, this is a volunteer effort in this program, and there's so many things that could be done. Um, so I hope a number of you would like to volunteer and, and, and be involved. Uh, by the way, a year and a half ago, we had a group of 100 together to put together uh, what can we do better or what are things that we can do that we're not doing, came out with 25 action items that we've been working our way through. And that group was very collaborative. It had people from Ascend. It had people from Leap. It had people from all these different organizations. So we'll send a note out to all of you who registered and just say and, and, and tell you how you can go. But uh, um, I'm taking Alan, Dustin, and Miriam's word that they're going to help out on the Committee of 100 effort because uh, it's great pay, right? You know, uh, so <laughs> so uh, that's one thing I think you can expect. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, maybe I'll just add to 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 raise a very thoughtful question that um, we are in the sharing mode, but you know what we're trying to do is make sure that we get this out to the various AAPI uh, forums. So we're actually launching this also with Ascend as part of the, the various chapters. I spoke about it at the Asia Society uh, last month. So there's, but I, and it's funny you asked the question. I think there's several people that came up to me. So what's the next video, right? Um, and I think part of this is laying out the groundwork for the baseline and what actions can be taken to actually implement some of the change that we need. Okay. Uh, Do you have a comment before we move on to the next? Yeah, so I think, um, as they said, that we're all uh, trying our own ways to you know, to spread this video around and get more people aware of it. So um, I'm actually doing like an offshoot event on July 1st. Um, uh, it's a stand-up comedy show where all the comments will talk about Asian work problems to get people more comfortable talking about it. Um, and then the video obviously will be playing, so we'll be reaching more younger audience as well. Okay. The next is E. Che. Uh, Hi. Um, go ahead, ask your question. Thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciated the video. I thought it was very, uh, it was very impactful and um, thoughtful. I just had a question on the reason why 
uh, you chose to combine to to lump Asian Americans together with Black Americans because this might be misleading because it's the ground based ceiling. So because Asians are more likely to be targeted because of advantages um, compared with Blacks, who are most likely to be targeted because of disadvantages. So this may in fact may make the ground based ceiling worse. Any comments from the uh, panelists? I'll uh, take. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. I think we we definitely had a lot of discussion about that part actually within our group, and what we're trying to do was to include their data as well because we want people to know that we are very much aware that the glass ceiling is not just for Asian Americans; it's for everybody with the color skin, right? And also, you know, LGBTQ uh, communities. So I, I think we what we wanted to do to convey this that yes, we are aware that we're not the only ones. Um, and also regarding to your question, I think yes, like you know, at one glance, Asian Americans are much more you know advantage in in some ways. But but if you really look at the data, we we you know our our uh, wealth gap and and you know uh, the poverty. Um, it, gap is very wide. It's the widest among all the minority groups. Uh, so I think you know we definitely need to do more to work with other communities, and also need to do more to you know um, share that we're not monolith, right? We have so many different groups in, in within our communities. Okay, we're going to go to Rita Hayden, and then we'll and then the last question will be from William Chen. So, Rita, your question. Rita, can you unmute yourself? Uh, okay, I guess that's not working. So, let me move on to our last question, which is William Chen. William, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm Bill Chen. I'm not sure what the real purpose of the video was, but in my opinion, based upon my experience, in order to break through the glass ceiling or bamboo ceiling, what's important is a demonstration of leadership, gaining uh, confidence and trust among those that you work with and work for, having a personality that establishes relationships uh, gaining the respect of your uh, bosses as well as contemporaries. And so my question is whether those are elements that are needed to break through the bamboo ceiling, why wasn't there emphasis or coverage of that? Yeah, I think that it's no doubt that all of the attributes and actions that you describe are still required, right, in order for someone to succeed. I don't, you know, our video is not intended to absolve responsibility from the individual for what it takes to be successful in their career, however they choose to define it. I think our goal was for awareness around some of the systemic challenges that given all of those things that you mentioned, even all things held equal, otherwise, there are still some systemic pressures that make those outcomes not as likely for the same amount of effort for the same set of circumstances. So I think that that was one of our goals, one of our primary goals. Well, I certainly can comment and say it's perfect for a follow-on, right? I think your, your current video really talked about what is a problem, what are the dimensions. So it would be logical to have a follow on whatever it is, podcasts, whatever, just saying, what are the things that you can do? And I encourage you, by the way, all of the, uh, all of the um, uh, Committee of 100 Asian American Career Ceilings uh, webcasts were recorded and they can be viewed on uh, the Committee 100 website. And we have quite a few that really address this issue, which is what can you do to overcome the problem? So I'd encourage you just to go to the website and choose the ones that you think would be most uh, helpful to you. Any other comments that anyone have to, to Bill Chen's uh, question? Okay, so with that, I wanna thank our three panelists. 
uh, for, uh, you know, uh, their comments and for the video. And I want to thank the audience. There's some really good questions. And uh, we had we had a good audience. And uh, again, I uh, uh, want to remind you that uh, on July 6th, we're going to have Asian American Career Ceilings, Corporate Journeys and Ethnic Differences. And uh, I'll end by a story that uh, Harrison Long said in the first webcast that we did. He said, there are some big differences by ethnicity. And he said, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, Indian Americans, if they see a, a mountain, the two, two executives will say, let's help each other up the mountain. Two Chinese Americans, they look at the, the mountain and the two executives say, well, if you ever get to the top of the mountain, I'll say hello to you. So that was the, uh, the joke that Harrison Lung said in the first webcast. And there's some truth to that. And that's part of the dimension that we're going to explore uh, on July 6th. So thank you all. Thank you, Dustin, Alan, and Miriam for producing the video, but also uh, being panelists on this. And I want to thank all of you in the audience. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event.